So thank you everybody for joining us. The CCIJ's professional learning series entitled Photojournalism, the Basics. My name is Esther, I'm with CCIJ. I'm just really pleased to have you all with us. And I'd like to um, uh, make sure that folks are noticing Scott Lewis there. He's the one on the video. He will be leading the session today. Real quick before we get started is uh, for those who are unfamiliar with CCIJ, uh, we are an organization that brings together visual data and investigative journalists from around the world to carry out ongoing investigations into issues related uh, issues um, uh, impacting, excuse me, vulnerable communities. And we do this in innovative and collaborative ways. And one of the ways that we do this is providing these uh, professional learning series, basically personal uh, capacity building for you all. Um, we invite folks like Scott Lewis, like other working journalists to share their knowledge, their experience and their passion for the work. Um, I'll drop in uh, Scott's bio in just a minute, but as for those who had a chance to read his bio, you probably figured out that he is a passionate photojournalist. Photos in numerous publications, he's won several awards, and he works collaboratively with other photographers and editors and designers, all in the pursuit of making photography not an afterthought, but rather an essential and core element to the story at hand. So as he's um, saying his remarks on these issues, I encourage you all use the reaction button, use the chat to share your reaction since many of you um, have your video off, which is totally fine, by the way. Uh, but just let us know, let Scott know what you're thinking. If you do have questions, please go ahead and post those as well in the chat. We will spend um, the last part of the time answering those questions for you. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and spotlight Scott and Scott, whenever you're ready, uh let's get started thank you esther uh welcome everyone this is fantastic so exciting to see people caring about visual journalism uh so much um yes yeah, so i'm gonna share my screen and kick this off um so yeah this is gonna be about visual journalism and I, i'm not gonna go on rants about how every organization should hire visual journalists yes they should, but that's not always uh, possible based on a lot of factors. So the idea is how can you do more and do better with the resources you have? Um, this is gonna be a lot about just breaking down the fundamentals of what visual journalism is, how to understand its value and then make the most of it, either if you're doing it yourself or you're looking to collaborate with other visual journalists. Um, CCIJ, I'm gonna do another brief overview of what we do that I think makes us a unique player in this space. Um, we're here, we don't just simply publish work, we're here to help other people do better and publish work themselves uh, and increase their skill sets and the range of what we, they do. We were founded with the concept that re investigative reporting, visual journalism and data science are all equal players. And that creates for a very different dynamic from a editorial strategy standpoint, as well as, um, strategies for innovation, revenue, partnerships. Um, it really makes us different. Uh, we're a core team, a very small eight part-time folks. We're a majority female organization. We have our teammate, our core team consists of people from Africa, Asia, Europe, the United States. Mo our editorial focus at the moment is in the US and Western and Southern Africa. We have more than 600 members uh, spanning about 40 countries. So we are a somewhat small, but shockingly, I think, diverse organization. And we really try and use that um, as much as we can. Um, so, like I said, this is gonna be about the fundamentals of visual journalism and also about working with visual journalists. So this report the New York Times put out a couple of years ago on where they wanted their goals to be in 2020. So a couple of years, the goals were for a couple of years ago and they've far surpassed many of them. Uh, they issued a 37 page report. There were 14 key findings they found in as it related to journalism, staffing and culture on how they needed to change. And I wanted to bring this in because I think that if the New York Times is willing to recognize the need to evaluate themselves, then everybody else should be willing to do the same. And the New York Times, as much as they are a one off, there's nothing like it. 
there's a lot that the rest of us can learn, steal, borrow, reappropriate to make ourselves better. Um, and as we all pursue journalism of ambition, sustainable business models, whatever our goals may be. So their number one finding of the paper of record for the United States was that the paper had to be more visual. They recognized the culture that they publish in and where they need to put their resources when it comes to innovating. And if anyone has followed the New York Times, they have far surpassed every goal they set for this 2020 report. Um, they are debt-free, several billion dollars in the bank. Something's working, and I think the rest of us can learn from this. When it comes to the visual um, report, they wanted, they saw the need for more proactive leadership um, and inclusion of maps, graphics, images, video, data visualizations. But they also wanted to get more comfortable with those, the people who create those things taking on more leadership roles. They want they recognize the need to shift from a writer or word editor centric position in all cases to one that was more inclusive of the rest of the newsroom uh, to expand the way they tell stories, what stories, what's a good story, and, and how do we look at it. They did this because we live in a visual culture. This article it came out in Slate in 2013, and it was prescient. It's a tongue-in-cheek story about the way we behave online, how we, what we read. And this writer, you know, he's poking fun at himself as a writer, knowing you're probably not going to read this story. And he, as you go through the story, he talks about like, who's left, who's left reading the story, et cetera. They worked with a company called Chartbeat who tracks web behaviors. And they found an interesting stat, which is that ha more about half your readers are gone halfway through. They just don't keep reading. But one thing he didn't mention, which I think is the most compelling part of this analysis was, look, look over here. Most people consume 100% of your content in video, of video and photographs. So to me, this is like opening up a cafe where you're going to, because you love your, you make great sandwiches and everyone says, you should sell all these sandwiches. And you throw in some salads too, because not everyone's going to want to buy a salad. And then you notice at the end of every day, half your sandwiches are left and all your salads are gone. So what's your business strategy at that point? Is it to keep making more sandwiches? Or do you perhaps recognize that there's a huge market that you're underserving for salads? Well, my argument is that there's an underserved market in journalism that in the journalism readership community that we should be addressing. There is a major US media outlet that I'm not gonna name, but we all know who they are. They're international. And I got some insight, insider data from them. Sadly for writers, people read a text story, spend about text story about 25 to 30 seconds. That's about what you're gonna get of someone's time unless they're really, really interested. This is the average, average time spent. But for video content, that's three minutes. Think of the, the greater depth you can tell in a story in three minutes of someone's time versus 30 seconds. That is a factor of six X of engagement. Now, I'm not saying that every story should be video, but what I'm saying is that there is a huge market and desire for content that is consumable in video or in visual um, platforms. So I wanted to really make this conversation about the fundamentals, like what do pictures do? Why do we even include them? Is it just to break up the text? Is it because people like puppies? I think that from a photojournalism standpoint, they do things that are really substantive. They connect us. They connect us to a lot of things, to, Oh, that went a little fast. Um, uh, people, places, ideas, our faith, our values, our motivations, our communities, our culture issues all over the world. In my greater aspirations as a photojournalist, I believe that they connect us fundamentally to our greater humanity and how stories on one side of a, of a town, a nation, or the world can help us understand our place in it. Um, you know, I went to my son's, uh, my children's uh, middle school open house last night, and the teachers were talking about these same things, about the reason we read literature is to be critical thinkers in the world to engage today. And I think that pictures contribute to that in an era when we can create really sophisticated images, 
that get to motivating us to act in some way. Um, for those of you not in the United States, there was a tragedy um, earlier this year in a small town in Texas. It was a school shooting. Yes, the United States is known for this kind of thing that happens a lot. There have been millions of words and stories written about this issue, and we as a nation can't seem to get beyond this. Um, and, and you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about it, writing about it, talking about it. And this story really struck me because it was something different. So here's this guy who was a retired school teacher, and he lives in this town. He's, he describes himself as an NRA Republican. And NRA is National Rifle Association. It's basically the biggest gun lobby in the United States. And he saw a photo of one of the victims. And I don't know what the picture was, but I'm guessing it was either a family photo or a school photo. But it motivated him. He connected to that picture. He's, as he says, it looked like his grandson. And as much as I would like to think that any child being shot in a school should make you care, this crossed an emotional line for him that he felt connected to this story in a way that nothing else prior to this did because the kid who was killed looked like his grandson. And it motivated him as a devout gun owner to turn in his gun that was the same type of gun that was used in the shooting. This is probably, and again, I don't know the picture, but it speaks to the impact of photographs. And it, it's, a, it's a simple picture. Obviously it's a family picture, not a sophisticated photojournalistic image, but it, it motivated something really profound in him, which leads me to want to talk about the different types of pictures that I deduce in photojournalism. There's literal pictures. These are, if you graph them, like the little graph here, they are high, relatively high impact, but short-lived in terms of their meaning that you're gonna get. These are the pictures that are like, here's the thing. It's like a person, place, thing. You know, this is a picture of a building. This is a picture of, you know, a, a field or a person. They're very straightforward. Their function is to rely on fact and clarity. Um, they are clearly organized, their elements uh, and the moments, the aesthetics, it's very easy to consume. Um, they're simpler images. Um, they're less artistic um, in their value to driving a story. Um, ultimately, their goal is to provide answers and clarity. And then there's interpretive pictures. Um, and these are images that have have an impact, but the longer you look at them, the longer you think about them, and the longer you experience them, their meaning continues, and you may revisit them, or it, it may think differently. So these pictures are less obvious. There's layers and complexity to the image. Um, this is something that would be more of a photographer's vision, not necessarily something you would see walking down the street. You may seriously be standing next to the photographer and they'll take a picture and you can't imagine what happened or where that picture came from, even though you were standing right there. These kinds of pictures challenge and ask more of the audience. So they sometimes have to, you have to do more work to sell them in a newsroom um, and, and maybe even sell them to your audience. But it were, it's about raising that bar to lay, increase the expectations of what a reader should be getting out of their, their news products. Um, these are pictures that are unexpected. They're surprises. They're things that you can't necessarily storyboard out before you go out into the world. Um, they're about something expressive and their goal unlike literal pictures which are to provide answers, these pictures are to evoke feelings, thoughts, ideas, challenge us, maybe force us to ask more questions than provide clarity and answers. Um, so I'm gonna go through a series of images that I think kind of go back and forth. Literal is gonna be on the left side as I'm looking at the screen, uh, interpretive on the right. So these are two pictures from a project we did in the Gambia on water contamination. Um, by photographer Jason Florio. Um, the picture on the left is a beautiful photograph, powerful photograph. It was pretty straightforward. The issue was this um, unhealthy relationship between free roaming animals, waste uh, products getting into the water source there on the right corner that people are using in their day-to-day -day life. It's straightforward. It's right there. Um, these pictures are maybe literal. They're literal. They can be very well done. The picture on the right is a very different kind of picture. Um, this is a picture in someone's home. Um, you have the secondary layer of the use of water with laundry drying. 
and you have this child who is you know playful engaging the photographer a bit but it's an image that i think most of us who have kids can relate to and again it takes us a little bit further into the lifestyle of of this community and um is makes us think a little bit about vulnerability in a different way um, with this issue again picture on the left here's the dirty water you know as a scientist beautifully done photograph very straightforward it shows us what high iron content in water looks like picture on the right is a man washing his face at the end of prayers at the end of the day um this picture is also beautiful but it brings us to a different level of engagement about how this issue might affect people um in the way that he's literally taking this this water and rubbing it on himself um and as but it's a part of a a very personal ritual um and challenge us to think about the role that this water plays in everyday life and these are pictures you have to just be there for and wait for um these are pictures from two different projects um the one on the left is in lesotho the one on the right is from nigeria uh the picture on the left is about a community that lives literally within steps of mass quantities of fresh water but they have no access to it um, partly because of the physical dangers they can't literally physically get to the water source so they have to take buckets scoop water out of boreholes and carry it up the hill strong photograph straightforward picture on the right is a story about increasing desertification in deserts in nigeria and how this is where a home once stood and this picture is a little you know the guy is obscured um this this scene is about the emptiness the um what was once here and so you have to sit here and imagine this was where a community was and it forces you to think a little bit more about the consequences of climate change and this particular issue um i'm gonna give a second to let you read these words this is a photographer that we worked with on another project of some of his interviews later who very much works in this arena of interpretive pictures what their value is um why we why we use them um what they bring to us in our reporting um and actually he this approach has actually led him to sort of leave photojournalism for the time being and pursue a doctorate in visual anthropology um from harvard and uh he it's it's a, he's got a really fascinating journey and we just actually featured him on our blog i don't know maybe esther you can share that link to the feature on ryan um talking about the kind of work that he does um so here's if you take something anything away from this this is the kind of slide that i created for people to print out and have at their desk about what is photojournalism this is reductive it's not it's not meant to be all things but it's it's a basic um look at what makes up photojournalism and how can i distill which how to bring a certain thing forward in terms of its storytelling value right like if it's a picture of a detail like a still life what do i need to do to make that picture powerful you have to think about the organization of the image the setting the time of day the light quality all these things matter these are all the different sort of elements of these kinds of pictures um that make them photojournalistically valuable engaging useful for the audience um and i'm not going to walk through each of these you guys can read them or save them for later but um this is sort of a building blocks if you will of what photojournalism is and there's a lot of things you could subcategorize these things endlessly um but it's meant to be a tool for thinking about how to bring photojournalism forward so i'm going to go through a series of pictures in the next slides that address each of these so action pictures you have to be there when the newsworthy thing is happening not when they're doing it conveniently for you so this is a story from that we did in zimbabwe um on um the burden that women carry in uh getting water for their families every day and this you know he has to be there first thing in the morning that's when people are doing this and this is a picture that gets in a little more layers and complexity um it's not just simply somebody scooping water into a bucket but it 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 gets at all these other questions there's something visually aesthetically beautiful about it which in issues like this when you talk about aesthetically beautiful and issues that are challenging my argument to that is that that those aesthetic qualities draw you in and creates a sense of compassion as opposed to 
exoticizing or uh, making a tragedy beautiful, you can cross a line for sure. You have to be sensitive to that. But um, if you make a picture that people want to look at, you're more likely to have them be engaged with the issues uh, that the picture brings about. And this is another picture that's simple uh, that Ryan took for a project we did in California on um, water issues in the Central Valley. Uh, this is a farmer grabbing a piece of fruit off of his tree. Um, yes, you don't see the person, but you don't always have to. You know there's a person attached to this arm um, and it's visually striking and draws you in um, and takes you in a different place when you think about water issues and farming. You know, it's about this growing these products for people to consume. Um, in the not action category, here's a portrait. This goes beyond just simply what you would expect. The light, he's shot it against the light. A lot of people think, oh no, the sun is behind you. You can't make a picture or behind the subject. You can't make a picture like that. Yes, you can when you know what you're doing. And for me, this is about not just simply saying, okay, stand here, I will take your picture, but there's a moment here. Um, this is a man whose aunt's house was regularly flooded by water. And, you know, the whole story was getting at the issue of what, why is nobody doing anything about this? Why do we let this problem continue? And what I love about this picture is this moment in this portrait of his raised eyebrow and that deep sense of skepticism that he brings to his place in this story that for me embodied how I felt as I read the story. And it, it was a great bridge to a technical kind of dry story that brought a lot of humanity to it um, that I thought was really powerful. Here's a more straightforward picture of a family of farmers for another story on the same topic. Um, but again, like the choices that he's making here about where to take this picture, who, which kid gets to stand on the chair, which elevates him, the light hitting him really beautifully. This gets at the issue of, you know, the continuation of the family farm and the tradition. And, you know, it hints at all these things um, with their farm in the background. It's a simple picture, but it's nicely executed. Places and things, every time I work with photographers or writers who are doing the photographs and there are landscape issues to be addressed, I jump up and down endlessly about the need to get out early and late. That means before the sun rises and you stay there until it is gone because those edges of light are when um, the things that are being revealed are most powerful and transformative. So again, this is still more of Ryan's work on our stories in California about issues of water. And this goes beyond just simply water in a, in a culvert here, but it really makes me feel about the vulnerability of this place, the scarcity of water. Um, this picture really drives that home for me um, and takes me there. It allows me to be in this place. When it comes to pictures of things, again, aesthetics are tremendously important. And this is an otherwise profoundly dull situation of a water pump on the side of uh, a young orchard. So all those yellow marks are supports for trees that have just been planted, I think pistachio trees. This picture is incredibly well organized and thought about um, that might seem deceptively simple, but there's a lot of time and consideration put into the structure of this image of how to make something profoundly dull, visually compelling. Here's a story from uh, the Lesotho project again on, um, the access to fresh, the limited access to fresh water. The writers followed through, did what I jumped up and down about, got out there ridiculously early. And this picture is transformative. I mean, the glowing blue of the water. I mean, this place is gorgeous and you feel it. And then you have to contend with the fact that the people who live within steps of this can't access it for their daily life. Um, in context of the journalistic product, it's heartbreaking. Um, Ideas are really challenging to illustrate. And this, again, this might be my last picture from Ryan, wasn't necessarily intended to be so heavy on him, but um, you know, this is about the infrastructure as it relates to the water crisis in Central California. Again, a rather simple image, but well done. The eerie light is actually related to this story. There were fires going on at the time and uh, driven by drought. So this feels like this thing, you know, that fell from outer space, um, you know, as they were transforming the infrastructure just left on the side of the road. So again, it's about seeing possibilities. And this assignment was extremely challenging um, for Ryan and myself as an editor. But um, when you really kind of just sort of follow your gut, maybe you don't know if it's going to be a picture, but take it anyway. We'll deal with whether it works or fits in later. 
but it's really about, and I really had to emphasize to Ryan just to trust his gut, just to really take, take pictures that make no sense in, in, on the surface in some ways. And when you follow that, sometimes you discover you were seeing things that you weren't even conscious of that become impactful later. Um, this is from our project in Zimbabwe. That again, you know, getting water out of boreholes takes me emotionally to a different place. Um, it's almost a still life, even though it's, you know, they're actively um, scooping water out of the borehole here. It, it really emphasizes the vulnerability of this reality for these people. And there's something really intimate about this um, rather everyday bowl, the bare feet, um, the physical risk and challenge of doing this. This picture is, I, I find it really powerful um, as a still life almost, or, or kind of landscape-y kind of, kind of image. Um, so when it comes to making thoughtful pictures, you, you have to think about how do we get there, right? Like what's the, what's the process that we have to go through to get to successful pictures? So very much like a writer, these factors here are very similar, right? The power of your story is going to be driven in part by the depth of your reporting. What do you know? What have you learned? What's revealing? What can you share that the casual person coming across this story might not see? You know, in photography, we talk a lot about, you know, going places where the reader couldn't go, you know, behind the scenes at a sporting event or into somebody's bedroom or uh, with somebody on a doctor's visit um, that illuminates the story and brings those issues to light. Um, uh, what story are you telling? You know, um, in every story that we do, we have choices about what avenue we're going to go down and that's going to bring the story forward. Um, and that is impactful. As a photographer, you want to think about that, um, you know, about what the story you're telling is. That's your job as a journalist is to filter out the noise and really get to the signal of what's important here and then how you're telling it photographically what's your approach are you going to be very interpretive Do you have to be interpretive like ryan just story about a town that was sinking and there was no evidence of it sinking even though the satellite data told us it was sinking how do you express that are you going to take a very humanistic approach and show portraits of people well how what are those portraits stylistically going to be um are you going to shoot this with all with one lens or you know, another lens or get really intimate with people or shoot it at a distance for a certain kind of impact. These are all factors that play into that final report. The dynamic you have with your subjects, um, that's really important. You need people to be comfortable with you so that they go about their lives so that you can document it to bring it forward. Um, they, you need to have trust um, and that comes through in the final images that you're going to be presenting. The last concern is technical. You know, the pictures have to be technically under control, just like you have grammar when you're writing a story. You have, you know, issues of focus, exposure, motion, all those kinds of things that factor in whether you're using a strobe, what kind of relationship you have with the ambient light and the strobe light, and whether you're shooting with a lot of depth of field or very shallow depth of field, all those things factor in. They're not very interesting for a lot of photographers to talk about, but they do matter. That all adds up to what? What are our goals? You know, as photographers, we want people to feel something. This is what photography does. It's visceral. It taps into parts of who we are as people that aren't, we're not always articulating, but we feel, we know, we understand. Um, it, we want pictures to make us think, you know, what are we doing to contribute to this issue? How are we addressing it in our own lives? How does it affect us? Um, we want to bring greater understanding you know, to a story. We want people to, you know, uh, come away knowing more than they knew before. And lastly, when it comes to the writer photographer relationship, don't repeat what the words are doing. Writers do amazing work. Words do their thing in the way they do their thing. Photographs should stand apart. It's a different medium. It doesn't succeed when it repeats the words. It succeeds when it builds off of the words um, in a different way. And I'll get into more of this when I talk about the relationship between photographers and, and writers. So when you're out photographing, uh, in photojournalism, we use the phrase of working a situation, which, you know, from a writer's perspective, it may be about how you interview or your sense of observation on uh, your depth of your research. 
photographers do those things too. But then when it comes to photographing, what does that mean to work a situation? So getting back to some of the things I've talked about before, going early, staying late, before the activity starts is always great, is, is when you should arrive. Um, even if you tell somebody, oh, I'll be at your house tomorrow, you're doing this thing at eight, maybe you'll get there at 7.30 just to, you know, A, give yourself time to arrive on time, but B, scout it out, take a look around. Maybe you have some time to, to get to know somebody a little bit early. Um, staying late, oftentimes the best moments happen after things have seemingly ended. Um, building rapport is, as I said before, hugely important um, with your subjects. Um, it's important to have what I call a 360 degree awareness about how the space you're in looks from different angles. Um, do you need a ladder? Do you need to get on a roof? Do you need to lay on the ground? Um, as photographers, we should have no shame in what it takes to make the image that we believe will be the most impactful, the most informative. Um, watch and learn. Uh, not everything you do is about clicking the shutter and being behind the camera. Sometimes it means putting the camera down, sitting in the corner and just watching a situation unfold. Um, you can learn a lot. It's a little more Zen approach to letting moments that might be useful and valuable pass um, because you have a greater mission, a greater vision about why you're there. Camera placement, like I said, get high, get low, be surprising. It's important to anticipate. And this is where being informed matters. What might happen next? So it's informed about the issue, it's understanding the people you're photographing, understanding the situation, um, and being able to see into the future, in a sense. And uh, that's, a, that's a very important skill to have um, in a lot of different types of situations. When you see a moment happening, never stop until it has stopped for quite a bit. Um, Many photographers have stopped shooting when they think it's over with, but then something happens and they want to kill themselves because they just missed a great moment. So it's really important when something's happening to just stay with it and keep photographing as something's unfolding. Um, two people may high five and you think that's a celebration, but then somebody decides to give a big hug and lift that person off the ground and you've put your camera down and you're looking at the back to look at the high five and you missed something 10 times better. Um, so you can always look at the pictures later. You can always check on that later. Um, physically get closer, emotionally get closer. And when you think you're close, get closer still. Um, fill the frame with useful information. That doesn't mean always pack it with stuff. Like some of those pictures like from Nigeria where that expanse of space is important. Um, so content isn't always a thing. It can sometimes be um, space to breathe or what designers call white space. Um, but it's about guiding the viewer through the frame, through meaningful things. Sometimes that's an item or a, a physical thing. Other times it's just the space to get there. Um, think in variety, tight lenses, wide lenses, close, far away, um, details, moments, portraits. That will always deepen a report and give your editors options and your readers greater understanding. Surprise me. Right? Come back with something that you couldn't expect or predict or um, that surprises the reader and takes us someplace new and different. And that will keep people coming back um, for sure. So I want to give two examples of how we put this stuff into us into actual practice. So here was an <laughs> something of an assignment for my personal life. So my kids were going off to summer camp this year as they do most years. And in the on the camp's Instagram account, they give the opportunity for kids to have a day, the countdown till camp. I can't remember when it starts, but in this case, my kids got day 47. So they want the kids to take a picture that expresses their excitement for day 47. My wife got a little impatient that the deadline was approaching to get the picture submitted and she went ahead and took her own picture. God bless my wife and she knows I'm doing this. This picture is terrible. <laughs> Half the picture is the floor. There's junk on the table. There's a crumpled up piece of paper. There's a water glass. There's two placemats. The kids are awkward. Um, it's it's it, it, it's it's not like engaging. And for God's sake, I'm a photographer. My kids should have the best picture of the whole Instagram account. So same camera, same room, same light. I was like, let me put a little time into this. Just a little bit, and you know, came up with this which I think is, is more natural, it's more comfortable, it's more engaging, it's dramatic. 
um, you know, there's more impact and the frame is filled with meaningful stuff. Jelly beans, in case you're curious, spelling out 47. Um, but now <laughs> I'm gonna take this forward into a photojournalistically practical situation. So this is from the project in the Gambia on water. And um, I asked the photographer, Jason, to give me the whole sequence of images that he shot leading up to what became our lead image for, the, for this project. So there's this young girl washing herself in this public fountain. And a lot of people might, this is what I was talking about, staying with a moment. So here she's washing her face and there's this beautiful light, beautiful colors. Um, Jason's right up in there. I mean, he is probably a two feet away from her. So he's physically very close. So he's gotta be confident, believe in himself, believe in his purpose about why he's there so that she's comfortable enough to do what she's there to do. And he doesn't stop photographing until she's done. And just image after image after image. And just to give kind of a quick like run through of, of what that looks like a little bit closer up, right? You know, any one of these a reasonable person might stop, but good photojournalists shouldn't always be reasonable people in this case. You squeeze that moment until it's truly dry and, and over with. And then here we have this final image, which is, there's a religious quality to it almost with this beautiful light, her hands almost in a prayer-like position, the water, these droplets splashing on her face really epically. And it, it is, he sent one frame and I never questioned to see any others because it was so perfect. But he only got there because he never let go. And that's important. Um, I wanted to transition a little bit into how can writers do this, right? A lot, of a lot of writers are today tasked with having to also be the photographer, and that can be challenging. And this is two writers that we worked with on one of our projects recently on desertification in Nigeria. This actually, as a side note, was conceived, researched, and pitched by our data fellow, Yushi Wang, who's from China and has a, a lot of interest in African issues. And we pitched the story to a new digital media outlet called Hum Angle. And uh, we got a great team there. We had, they had their data people, our data people, and these two intrepid reporters who went out into a very remote corner of Nigeria to tell this story. Um, and I worked with them before they left, kind of doing something very similar to what I'm doing today, which is talking about the fundamentals of photojournalism, visual storytelling, visual journalism, how we do it, why we do it. And they would send back images um, as they were reporting um, and lots and lots of pictures of the desert, but um, they really went in fearlessly. They didn't come in with a lot of preconceptions about what their pictures should look like. And um, we produced this really lovely report on the conflict that comes about between herders and farmers. Um, and here was an amazingly intimate image of a man who had been shot by an arrow. That white thing is an arrow in his shoulder um, in the clinic being cared for, they interviewed him. Um, it's really compassionate image, really powerful image that, you know, when I talk about getting close in all ways, this is really close, right? I mean, this is, you know, um, a really powerful image, but it's done with care and you can see that he's comfortable. They have a good rapport. Um, we edited this to bring about, like, how do you tell like two different stories going on at the same time about, you know, when we're not necessarily there when their conflict's happening, um, so you have this struggle of farmers reseeding their, their land because, you know, the, the grazing cows have come in and eaten everything and they were really thorough and they weren't afraid to take what they might perceive as risks. Um, and again, here's that picture from earlier in, in context, um, about telling this story. Um, we work to present our images with text that reemphasizes what we have. So this quote here. Uh, from a herder talking about this issue reemphasizes kind of like the consequences of this. And we want our images to serve that, that greater goal. And, you know, here we're playing on some fundamentals of picture editing, you know, juxtaposition, you know, you have this invasive grass, which is a contributing factor to the reduction of farmland. And then here you have where a community once stood um, and that sense of desolation um, is really powerful. Um, and, you know, he takes us into the market here where there's a lot of trading going on, where there's a lot of interaction. Um, you really feel like you're walking through the market here, the perspective, where the camera placement is, waiting for 
this man here in the center to have the light catch the top of his hat. These things aren't necessarily conscious, but this is why this picture works so well. Um, and it's well balanced. Um, not every picture needs to be big. Some pictures work effectively small. Um, and we don't always want to speak in that loud voice of a huge image. And so sometimes the best choice is to scale an image down. And it creates variety. If you think of like a musical score, where if everything was up tempo, you might be exhausted halfway through. You want to give people a bit of a break throughout that process. Um, and then here, again, from a, I think personally, from a writer's perspective, this would seem like a very risky kind of image to make. They are far from the subjects. There's a lot of space included. The composition might not be obvious, but I think this is a powerful, beautiful, very well executed image that speaks to this issue. This is, and we, I don't know if people have heard about the uh, Great Green Wall that's being built across Africa. And this is the wall. This is where they're planting the trees that will establish this Great Green Wall. So it really, it's shocking in some ways because I think of the green wall as a big green wall, but it doesn't start that way. But it really helps me understand and go to this place to see and offer up a solution. I mean, this is a solution kind of image that we like to think about when we do photojournalism so that people are not just exposing something, but we're helping people have greater understanding. And here was Kunle's comments on this process of our relationship and where they came, uh, where they got to. I'm gonna give you guys a second to read this and then have something really cool to share. Um, in the United States, we, there's an organization called INN, which is a uh, community of nonprofit news organizations. And this is the first year they have um, categories for visual journalism. And it's divided up by the size of your publication based on revenue, because it's all nonprofit. And um, this project was one of the ones that we entered into this competition. And it was named one of the four finalists um, of the category for us in, in this competition. And we'll find out, I think, tonight if we won. So it's a huge accomplishment for, I think, a couple of writers who previously didn't take photography very seriously to trust what we shared with them, to trust themselves, to trust trying something different um, and actually produce something at a really high quality. And um, the fact that they cared about this issue, they cared about doing a great job and being outside of their comfort zone really showed. And I'm really proud and happy to have been a part of that and to be able to hold this up as, as a standard that we anyone can strive to. You know, there was nothing special about their photography experience before. They just simply believed and they went and they did it. And that's like commends them tremendously for, for being willing to do that. And I think as they go forward, I'd like to think that this becomes part of their bag of tricks of things they know they can do and increases their value whether as a staff member or as a freelancer. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about working with us. <laughs> um, photographers, God bless us, we have a reputation for being difficult to work with. And I, I think it can be a valid question. Um, I like this cartoon, it, it's an analogy I use a lot, which is, you know, if we judge an elephant by its ability to climb a tree, we will deem it a failure. Um, but that's not what elephants are designed to do. Uh, they're designed to do all kinds of other things and fish don't climb trees either. Photographers shouldn't be judged by the standards uh, that don't make sense for them. Uh, news organizations, for better or worse, are built, designed and, and strategized for writers. And that's the way it has been for obvious reasons. Um, but that doesn't mean that's the way it has to always be. And if we think about the value we each bring in our own unique ways, then we can rethink those relationships when we think about what are we, are we reporting or are we writing? Those are, there's two different sides of that equation that I think we have to be conscious of. And same with photographers. Writers and photographers see the world differently. Um, we, we think about the world differently and this is an asset that we can use. You know, writers are, these are generalizations. Yes, there's exceptions to everything. So like, yeah, not every writer thinks linearly, sometimes think intuitively, yes. But broadly speaking, you know, generally speaking, writers and photographers look at the way they tell stories and the way they identify stories in different ways. So in writers and thinking in words and linearly, photographers think intuitively with rhythm and 
um, holistically and not always about facts. And so I think if we recognize that in the partnership that we come to together, we can take advantage of both of our strengths in unique ways and drive each other to new places. Um, so when we talk about these partnerships, we we'll to talk about two different things that we should and shouldn't do. So what should we embrace? We should embrace letting photographers take the lead, especially in their own reporting. Um, share that journey, that, that control of the, of the steering wheel. It doesn't mean that the photographer tells you what to write about, but it means when you talk about what is the story we're reporting, have a back and forth, right? Leadership isn't a, a one person thing. It's, it's about charting that course together. Collaborate, listen to each other, trust each other. Um, one of the greatest things, compliments I ever got as a photographer when working with uh, veteran writers was when one of them said to me, you taught me how to shut up when it came to being out of reporting, which was not always interviewing, not always asking questions and sometimes just sitting back and watching. And this was a case where like, every, if they would always interview the person while I was trying to shoot, then I couldn't do my job. And they discovered by letting me do my job, watching what happened, they learned a lot because it was a very different way than they had previously reported. And again, became part of the bag of tricks. Ask people what they think. You know, you're working together um, because they may not be as much of a subject matter expert as you might be as a writer. They may still have a fresh take on something that challenges and surprises you. And that's good. And thus be open to how they see the story and how they want to tell it. It may be different than you, but that could add to your final report because you're saying something different. It's related. It's a Venn diagram where you have a little bit of an overlap and it deepens your report. Now, things to avoid doing when working with photographers or uh, visual journalists. Deciding what, when, and how for the photographer. They should be masters of their craft and know when evaluating a situation and a story, where the opportunities lay, when they may find them, where they want to be, how they want to be. They should be taking that lead. And they don't always, because in a lot of ways, the industry has taught them not to, but I believe they should be. They should be grabbing that. The rain's and taking charge, um, telling a photographer what to take a picture of. Talking about what's important to the story is different than telling a photographer what to take a picture of. Um, there may be cases where that's important. You know, it's a document. It's this specific thing is important to me for a story. That's one thing. But letting photographers explore the space on their own is really important to this dynamic. Um, if a photographer is working in a situation and there's things happening, don't chit chat with the subject. Let it happen. You'll have your moment to do that, but the photographer may never get that moment back. It's sort of an inverse relationship where when your craft may come, when you come back to the, the, your office and you contemplate how you're gonna tell the story, photographers don't have that luxury. If it's gone, it's gone. It can't be you know, redone. So if something critical is happening as a writer, it's best to just you know, take a back seat, let that happen uninterrupted, and then you can always talk later. Um, photo edits and story edits should be complementary, but they shouldn't, be dictated by the other. So you may write a story with a very particular outlook. The photo edit doesn't need to follow that to be functional and useful. This gets back to the very beginning about how we experience stories um, and what we consume. From the printed page perspective, we know from years of data, the very first thing people look at is the photograph. The second thing is the headline. The third thing is the caption. The fourth thing maybe is they read the story. So the picture edit must be a thing that can stand on its own to guide people, readers through a story that is engaging and holistic and informative in its own right, because they may never read the story. So you've got to make sure that that picture edit can communicate something in and of itself. So you have to have a sense of opening and establishing the story, continuing it through, builds logically, emotionally, and a sense of conclusion. And it may be just three pictures, it may be one picture, but the pictures should be recognized as a thing that can function on its own um, in partnership with the words. This Nothing here is absolute. There's always a time and a place for something, but generally speaking, this is an approach that will get the most value out of each uh, discipline. Um, so when it comes to a bit, you know, an assignment and how do, we, how do we assign a visual journalist to a story with all of this insight, knowledge, perspective, so instead of saying, photographer, show up here and take a picture of this, let's start, what is the story? Just what's the story about? Not what are you writing about? 
not what is your take on it, but what is the bigger story? And then why are we doing it? What matters here? What's important? Um, who is important? And what inside of that, this narrative, this, this issue, are important things that we need to pay attention to? Are there details and locations that are specifically important? Um, what relevant events are happening? All of these things will come together to factor into how a photographer, visual journalist should approach telling their story. Um, photographers, visual journalists, again, aren't always, aren't always trained to think this way, in this authoritative way, but more and more current generation, really sophisticated visually are, I think, in a perfect opportunity to start doing these kinds of things. And I think that this is a great stage for which to push people to do that. Even if you're working with a photographer who may be hesitant to do that, as a writer, you can encourage them to do that. Say, take the lead. How do you want to do this? And I'm going to give you the raw materials for you to go out and make your impact in telling the story. Ultimately, in the end, I think hiring visual journalists is a great thing to do. We should all think about doing it, um, work together in partnership. And I am good. Soapbox. I was on mute. Oh, wow, Scott, I just want to first, if everybody can on their video or the reaction, just give a quick applause. Uh, that was a lot of information and yeah. really relevant information, I should add. Absolutely. I see a lot of props. Uh, just to reassure folks that this slide deck will be available as a PDF following this presentation. We do have a couple of questions, Scott. Um, sure. I'll read them out loud, but I certainly invite the people who posted just to provide some contextual uh, stuff related to the question. I'm just going to go in the order that they were posted. So this is um, from Gia uh, Rara. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, Scott, if you're looking at the chat, it is a timestamp at 20 minutes. Uh, she is from Radio Republic Indonesia. Her question is, I work in a media that uses several methods for news distribution. First, online media form writing, photos and videos, and also using number two, radio, audio. It's a must. Do you think we need to do all that or is it better to focus the most viewers? Oh, uh, I mean, I think it depends on your resources, the moment at hand, the story itself. Um, having a rule that every story must always have everything can get a little daunting and overwhelming and sometimes just simply not worth it. So I think that, you know, some not every story needs the pictures. I mean, some stories just really aren't, it's not worth trying to come up with images for a story. So um, it's about, like I think a lot of things, you know, um, making informed decisions on what's a good use of your time and your resources, as well as storytelling impact. Um, sometimes the best choice is to say, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do something here. Okay. Uh, is, uh, Gia, is there a follow-up question to the comment there? Feel free to take yourself I'm, off. I'm, yeah, yeah, you I, think it's enough. I, I get it. I get it. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Okay, the next question comes from Sophia. That's timestamp 20, uh, 22. Uh, you have the investigative written articles, which are going in depth and often so mostly longer. What do you do about it? And the second question, is there a best position to spread your pictures between the articles? Uh, Sophia, would you clarify what do you mean what to do about it? I'm not sure I follow. Sophia, if you could take yourself back. Hi, I, sorry. That's okay. Uh, well, yeah, I'm an investigative journalist and I do mostly written articles and um, yeah, they are very long, you know, and like uh, when you said in the beginning, uh, you only have so many uh, seconds that people keep their attention to your article. So uh, I was thinking, uh, do you have any ideas how to combine it with uh, pictures to to have it more, uh, yeah, keep, keep people's attention or something? I don't know. Um, I was thinking... How to do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, there's no one answer, really. Um, I think that good work keeps people engaged, regardless of what it is. Um, uh, there are times where one picture does everything you need it to be to do. Um, I don't think that pictures should be used to just keep people in the story just for the, oh, there's, it breaks up the text. It can be a challenge in really long, in-depth writing, um, for sure. 
and uh, it could be about other tools like data visualization or other other visual uh, journalistic tools to keep people engaged. Depending on the story, it really should be a relationship between you know that the written pieces as well as um, how the visual adds to it. I mean, that's the first thing is what does this add to our understanding in, of this experience? And that doesn't sound like an answer, yeah, <laughs> I don't know, yeah. but um, it's a hard, it, it's hard. And then as far as layout goes, I mean, that's where design comes in and design really, you got to think about it as an equal partner as well about carrying that, that narrative conversation forward. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Uh, several of the links that we provided, uh, the photos that Scott showed came from our articles, and our articles are pretty long, so that could also serve as sort of a way to think about it based on how we've yeah. approached it, certainly how Scott has approached it. Let's be honest, how Scott approaches it. <laughs> um, let me ask this next question here, at timestamp at 33. Uh, please discuss equipment for a freelancer with no budget. I'm, t I'm taking video and photos on my iPhone, which does the job, but what are your suggestions for equipment for someone like me? Uh, it depends on your level of commitment to learning how to use more sophisticated gear. Um, you can do a ton with iPhones. I mean, there are some photographers who I admire tremendously who have now are only using iPhones. So as a tool, it can be very effective in the right hands, but that's what it is, it's a tool. So I could tell you, go out and buy some Nikon or Canon something, but you know, um, it's really going to be driven by your commitment to really understand that next level tool. And it, it takes time. I mean, it, it just takes time, a lot of experimenting, a lot of failures, a lot of confusion, um, a lot of frustration. So um, I don't think it's necessary uh, to do effective work. Um, I think you can do a lot of effective things with a phone. Mm -hmm. I think and just for some context, I have experience, you know, um, learning, learning and using actual cameras, but as technology has evolved and social media is where I'm sharing most of my, my stories is where an iPhone really has become into use. And just want to clarify my last comment, um, live transcriptions working for me, but I uh, just want a friendly reminder to other journalists, if you're using audio forward or audio focused journalism, just a friendly reminder to enable closed captioning on that medium. Thank you. Thank you for that reminder. Uh, uh, Scott, if, is it true that the Humangle folks um, use their phones? I think they use a mixture of phones and cameras. Um, and as far as cameras go, I mean, mirrorless is where things are going for those of you considering. So SL DSLRs are kind of on the way out, even though it's what I still use personally, but mirrorless are kind of on the rise. There's some real upsides to that. Um, smaller formats, quieter. You can do some things you couldn't do otherwise, but um, the camera industry is kind of endless. So it's hard to give you like a simple answer, but um, small scale mirrorless cameras made by Sony, Fuji, Nikon, et cetera, are all really good. Um, uh, we are at the, the top of the hour, um, so we will need to close. I know there's one more question, so Scott, I'll give that to you. And when I send my uh, email afterwards, including the slide deck, Scott, if you wouldn't mind responding to that question, I can share that with the folks here um, within that email, So uh, because we have run out of time. So. Sure. So with that said, I just want to thank everybody once again, if you can just give um, uh, some uh, some love to Scott uh, for a tremendous presentation. Uh, we continue to do this work. We have another session happening in October. Satiris, as a matter of fact, who's on the screen, he's going to be talking about data. Um, and that's not a scary word. I've learned that that is not a scary word. Embrace it. Uh, it is a powerful tool. So we are here to help you do the good work that you are already doing. So with that, on behalf of CCIJ, I want to thank everybody for your participation. We look forward to seeing you at our next session. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you again. Thanks, all. Thank you.